there's something on the inside working on the outside brought about a change in me well there's something on the inside working on the outside it brought about a change in me i got jesus on the inside working on the outside it brought about a change in me i got jesus on the inside working on the outside brought about a change in me well there's something on the inside it's working on the outside it brought about a change in me well there's something on the inside working on the outside it brought about a change in me i got that joy on the inside working on the outside Amen. it brought about a change in me Amen. brother it brought about a change in me Amen. hey i'm glad i got that joy Amen. i'm glad i got that peace Amen. i'm glad i got that holy ghost that comforter Amen. if that don't stir you up you better examine yourself Amen. hallelujah I, I just thank you. I just thank the Lord. I'll just cut it short right there, and that's all right. I just thank the Lord. Amen. Amen.
situation that we're in, mm -hmm. you know, when we were lost, we had to turn our eyes to yeah. Jesus mm -hmm. to receive him. On this journey, we have to still fix our eyes yeah. upon him for every single yes. day. Yes, amen. Because if we take a step on our own, that's where we can deviate from the right path. Right. And I, I just, I constantly pray that the Lord will help me to have not only the spiritual eyes to follow him, but the spiritual ears mm -hmm. to hear, to be sensitive to that kind of spirit. Mm -hmm. And I'm just so thankful that he allows people to pin down those words, mm -hmm. and then he can guide you and direct you to, to link those up. Because anytime that he's repeated himself, he said something more than once, you know that it's important. Yeah. And I can't think of anything more important than keeping those spiritual eyes on, on him. Yeah, right. yeah, I enjoy the song. Blessing. Amen. Yes. And that and a lot of that comes through stuff that's been taught here for, for as long as I've been here is making sure that you're abiding with Jesus and what allowing yourself to be filled with what he has to offer for you. Not not allow yourself to be distracted or, or take in stuff that's of this world, but allow yourself to be filled with his spirit. And when that when that when that happens, then you're able to easily um, discern what he wants you to do or how, where the where his spirit's leading. And I'm yes. thankful that I'm thankful that he's uh He's that easy to access. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, uh, but unless anybody else has, well, I got. Uh, I, you know, sometimes we uh, we pray for people, and sometimes uh, it's laid on our heart to pray for people when we don't even we we weren't even thinking about it. That happened to me this morning, about eight thirty. I was going across town and and it pouring down the rain, you know, one thing or another. And the, and the Lord told me to pray for Kathy Ham mm -hmm. and Jerry Miller. I pray for both of them. Yeah. I, I'm not bragging about it. I'm just saying 
but a lot of times we have to be meaningful yes. when the when the Holy Spirit tells us something. Yes. That's what we got to do. Right. We got to do it right then. Yeah. Okay, well, Lord, I'll, I'll wait till I get home and do yes. that. Yeah. You know, where I can get down on my knees, right. I'm driving down the road. Yeah. But I can still pray for them. Amen. And I thank God for it. I, I don't know what the outcome is for either one of them. You know, only God knows. Exactly. But I can pray for them. Yes. yes. We're supposed to be obedient in, in the moment and, and just trust that he knows what he's doing. Yes. Because yes. he does. Yes. yes. <laughs> Amen. All right. Come on up, brother. I was thinking while Brother Roger was talking, Brother Percy Ray said, you can pray any time, but he said when the Holy Spirit beckons you to pray, that means he's on the line right now. I like that myself. Uh, I, I believe you can pray at any time, but I think there's times where you're invited and you can go right in. And I'll say this, I've prayed plenty of times and I don't know that I went into the throne room. It wasn't a waste of time to pray, let me say that. But I will say there's been a few times where I walked out and I knew it was as good as took care of. And uh, I'm glad we've got a God like that. I'm glad we've got a high priest that wants us to come before him and make our petitions known. What about it? a God so great as he is that he would care what's on your mind? That he would want to talk with you or have fellowship with you? I, that, that boggles my, my imagination. All right, Genesis tonight, the book of Genesis chapter 26. Good to be here. Hadn't it been good to be here? Enjoy all of it. All the songs, everything that's been shared. All right, Genesis 26, verse 1 says, And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries. I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Then come down to verse 12. The Bible says, Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the day. Lord, we thank you for the scriptures. I pray, Lord, you'd give us power and anointing to preach them. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts be open to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to preach to you tonight on God, the God's blessing of multiplication. I was passing out my outline. Some folks take it and they use it for notes. And Caitlin said, surely this isn't a message about arithmetic, is it? I said, if it was, I couldn't preach it. Amen. <laughs> God laid this on my heart the other day. And it's been, has it been, so oftentimes if God gives you something, the longer you think on it, the bigger it becomes. And I wanted to share this with you about this. I uh, wanted to say in the story that you realize that God, uh, Isaac's in the same land that Abraham was, and, they, and like the Bible said, Abraham went through a famine. And God, for whatever reason, God let Abraham go to Egypt. Sometimes the Lord lets us, puts us under pressure to see what we're going to do under that pressure. In other words, he did have the option of calling out to God and saying, should I stay or should I go? But, and I'm not faulting Abraham. We all have had to learn the hard way. But God didn't do that with Isaac. He just met with him and said, don't go down to Egypt. So God must have known it was in Isaac's heart to do the same thing. He said, sojourn in the land that I tell you of. And, I, and now here's the thing about God. And the, fa God, the thing of it is, is, and I'm trying to remind this of myself, and I want to remind you, the world's uh, situation is topsy-turvy. I get it. I understand that. But that doesn't mean that it's got to be that way for you. There's a difference between you and the world if God is your father. Amen. That's so somebody said, well, we're in an economic downturn. That don't mean a thing for you if God is your source. Amen. Now, I like this. The Lord said, sojourn in the land, I tell you. And Isaac did. He stayed. But I would say that he had to sow that seed by faith if it was during a famine. But the Bible said in that year, he received a hundredfold. You know what that is? That's multiplication. That's beyond addition. Multiply means to increase in number by greatly. So I want to preach to you tonight on God's blessing of multiplication. I will say in the beginning, when God made Adam and Eve, his mandate on them was to multiply. That's what he told them to do. And, and another preacher pointed this out. Me and dad's talked about this. I had never thought about this. 
Uh, if you and your spouse just have two children, you have not multiplied. You have just replaced yourselves. If you multiply, you'll have to have more than your, you and your spouse. I had never thought about that. Now, we'll say this, and I'm not going to get sidetracked here. The reason we're going to be overtaken by our enemies is because we're living in a materialistic society where it's all we can do to have one kids, and our enemies are having nine. In about two generations, there are going to be more of them than there is of us. But the Bible mandate is we're supposed to multiply. And I will say this, it's a lie of the devil to say that, that God can't provide enough food on the face of the earth to cover everything. And I will say this too, God told us to fill the earth. Amen. Now here's something that God showed me that I hadn't ever paid attention before. Before God told him to be fruitful and multiply and replenish, the Bible says this, God blessed them. The word bless in that verse means to make successful. What that means is God gave them the ability to meet their responsibility. Now, it don't, uh, they don't tell you at the beginning of the Bible, but I believe Eve was having several children every time she had birth. Listen, it wasn't just Cain and Abel. They're the only ones mentioned because they're highlighted for the story of God's purpose. If there's no other people, then why is Cain worrying about vengeance? There's other folk there. God blessed them. Not only were they, listen, not only were they fruitful, God made it so they could multiply. God's blessing on them was multiplied. You know why God told them to multiply? Because they were made in the image of God, and God said, fill the earth with my image. Yes. You know why Satan hates you so much? You're made in the image of God. You know why he wants your body so bad? It's made in the image of God. I want to point out to you a few things tonight that God's blessings of multiplication is on. Number one, it's on sacrifice. This is what Christ spoke of the blessing of multiplication after sacrifice in John 12, 24 and 25. This is what Christ said shortly before he went to the cross. He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Let me uh, share with you what he's saying there. As long as the kernel doesn't go down, or the seed, or he called it a corn of wheat, I'll call it a seed. As long as the seed stays on this side of the ground, it don't die, but that's all it'll ever be. One seed, big whoop. But he said, should it go into the ground and die, he said it brings forth much fruit. Let me tell you, there's a law of sowing and reaping. Here's the law. When, whatever you sow, that's what you get. You can't sow pumpkins and get corn. Whatever you sow, that's what you get. But I will say this, what you get is more than what you sow. When an ear of corn comes out of the ground, it's more than what you put in. The law of sowing is we get back more than what we invested. Now, here's what I like about this. What Christ was talking about was more than just talking about a corn of wheat in the ground. He was talking about himself and his own death. He's, you see, what he's trying to say is, I can stay alive, but it'll just be me. But if I, got, if I die and I'm resurrected, I'll be able... I may have to take a little running spell on this. I'll be able to multiply myself! You realize all the crowd that hated him on Calvary said... We hate that man, we hate his message, we hate his miracles, and we're done with him. And they wiped their hands. What they didn't know is 50 days later, he multiplied himself over and over. And for 2,000 years, he still multiplied himself over and over and over again. They said, we're done with this man. But a few chapters later, they're having to deal with Peter and John. They said, man, they're acting an awful lot like Jesus Christ. You know what? The same Christ that was in the earth was inside them. He multiplied himself. Praise God. But I want to show something here. We wouldn't have that blessing without the death. Without the sacrifice. Now we'll say this. The Lord gives us a, 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 a further teaching when he says this. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. Let me help you out with, with that verse. That verse is not spoken, I don't believe, to lost people. It's spoken to saved people. Here's what he's saying. You're, this would be good for us to remember. Mallory, you're young. And boy, I wish I could go back to your age with all the knowledge I've got now. Oh, how things would be different. But I want you to know something. 
the Lord saved you, not so that you could live the rest of your life how Mallory wants to, mm -hmm. but if you will lay down your dreams right. yes. and what you want and let him give you what he knows yes. he wants to give you, Amen. what he'll give you will last throughout all eternity. Yes. Right. So you want to know something here. There's a lot of Christ Christians today living for number one. They sow to the flesh. It's all about the campground. It's all about the hobbies. It's all about how much I can get. Brother Mitchell used to say, it's all I can get and canning all I get and sitting on the can. Amen and amen. It's all about me and it's all about what I can get. I'm not saying they're doing anything morally wrong, but I'm saying they live life like it's all about them. When the Lord said you have to hate your own life, he didn't mean you despise living. What he's saying is you don't care to fulfill your dreams. You're more interested in serving the purposes of God. Can I get a witness right there? If you'll lay your dreams aside, his dream will be bigger than your dream. Poor Moses didn't get to be prince in Egypt, but he walked through the Red Sea. Somebody say amen right there. His dream is bigger than your dream. Not only that, listen, if you do live down here and you have the best of education, and I'm not against education, I'm just saying if you could learn everything there is to learn and you could buy everything there is to buy, you are going to die and leave it. It's going to go to corruption. But if you lay up treasures in heaven, there's no moss up there. There's no thieves up there. And it will last for all eternity. That ought to be enough to want us to lay a little bit of sight up there. But it'll take sacrifice down here. Listen to this. This is what Peter said. I believe this takes place after the rich young ruler come and the Lord told him to sell all that he had that he might have treasures in heaven. I want to know something. That means exactly what he said. Yeah, he could keep his possessions here, but he's going to die and leave it. He said, or you could sell it and give it away. And the reason he told that man to do that is because that man loved those things. See, God will never be number two in your life. He'll never come right behind possessions or anything else. So he said, go ahead and get your God out of the way. He said, I'll give you. He said, you'll have treasures in heaven. That means exactly what it says. See, God's economy is exactly opposite of what we do. See, down here to be rich, you've got to hoard it up. But to be rich in glory, you've got to give it away. So after that man went away sorrowfully, this is what Peter said. Then Peter said, lo, we have left all, talking about the twelve. And followed thee, and they had. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you. In other words, Peter's saying, Lord, we have left all. Peter left a wife. He was married at the call. He left a mother-in-law. He probably shouted over that. They left a business. Do you realize they pulled the ship to the, to the shore and left it? Didn't even sell it. Left the nets, left it all, just left it all behind. So Peter's saying, Lord, we have sacrificed. What shall we get for our sacrifice? Now, watch something. I like what the Lord said here. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Let me tell you something. If you are going to follow Jesus Christ, you are going to make some sacrifices. And those sacrifices might be possessions. He said houses or lands. Though some of those sacrifices might be even more costly relationships to people who are supposed to be close to you. Mothers, fathers, Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. I want to go in God's will, but I've already learned from Abraham, you can't take everybody with you. Abraham tried to take his daddy. He died on the journey. He tried to take Lot. You see how that worked out. Listen, not everybody can go into the place God's called you. But to go with God, you may have to let mom and go. You may have to let daddy go. You may have to let the kids go. But I want you to know something. It'll be worth it. You know what he said? They shall receive manifold, multiplied. You'll never, I, I've heard preachers say it all my life, and they're right. You ain't going to outgive God. He won't let you do it. He'll not listen. Amen and amen. He said, he told Peter, slow your roll. I know what you've given up, but it'll be multiplied. Praise God, there's a blessing on sacrifice. If we'll do it. I want you to know something here. And I, I'm going to stay, say that I feel pressed to say it. So I'm going to say it again. Salvation is absolutely free. Yeah. 
Won't cost you a thing. Won't cost you a thing. To be spiritual will cost you a whole lot. That comes with a price. J. Harold Smith, who's in heaven, who God gave him one of the greatest messages of the 20th century, God's three deadlines, I've heard it many times. He preached it over 3,000 times, I believe, and his wife said she heard it almost all those times and it was never the same way twice. But it's on public record that a million, over a million people walked an aisle and made a profession under hearing the message, God's three deadlines. But I want you to know something. When Jay Harold said, Lord, I'd like to win a million souls and prayed about it, what he didn't know was his youngest boy was going to get caught up in some airline fuel or airplane fuel and got burnt up to a crisp and died at eight years old. And he said, as I knelt down next to him and he's burnt to a crisp and I, he can't even hardly speak above a whisper. He said, when I knelt down to pray, he said, the Holy Spirit said, do you still want to win a million souls, Jay Harold? Right. Amen. And what I'm trying to say is it'll cost you something. It'll cost you something. It'll cost you something. But J. Harold Smith told Dr. Kidd, who will be here in a few weeks, he said, when you pull in, I've said this before, this won't be new to you, but it's good, so I'm going to say it again. He said, when you pull into the gas station, you got 93, you got 89, and you got 87. Now, let's know something. 93 is better. Your car runs better. It operates better. You know why nobody pays for 93? Because it costs more. Now, let's know something. We can come to church Amen. And we can go through the rigmarole and we can go through a routine and we can somehow fake some shouting and all that other stuff. But I want you to know something to have the power of the Holy Ghost. It'll cost you something. It'll cost you something. I want you to know something. It'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. There's a blessing on sacrifice. There's a blessing of multiplication on sowing. I touched on that a minute ago. Sowing. This is what it says in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Be not deceived. So that means we could be. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Again, not written to lost people. It's impossible for a lost person to sow to the Spirit. Impossible. Impossible. What it's trying to tell us is, Brad, and I know you know this, it tells us as long as we live this life, it's full of choices. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not even related to Calvinists. I'm not of the clan that God is, we're just robots and we're just doing exactly what God programmed us to do. I want you to know something. God can be sovereign and you can still have a will. My will's not greater than God's. I understand that. But I want to know something. God's great enough to know everything that's going to happen and still allow me enough space to make choice. Yeah, if he doesn't allow you to make choice, he can't judge your choices. Yeah, Am I still among friends? You know what we're going to stand in for judgment for? Choices. Yeah. Choices we made. So we've got a choice. Just like Isaac had a choice to go and sow in another country or sow in the land God told him. It's like this. There's two parts to you. You're a triune being, but you can sow in two areas. To the spirit is everything to do with God and his kingdom. To sow to the flesh is everything to do with you. Pleasing you. That's like I said a moment ago. It's all about us. I would minister to folk, but it's going to cost me some time. I would do this, Lord, but it's going to, you know, it would cost me. But I want to know something here, and I'm preaching and I'm not being ugly, I promise you. We lie to ourselves when we say we don't have time. No, 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 we just choose to do do something else with the time we have. And then we lie and say we just didn't have time. No, we just made bad choices with the time. Now here's the thing about sowing to the flesh. You will reap. I told you, there's a law of sowing. Whatever you sow to, you're going to reap. I want to know something here. He said you'll reap corruption. Corruption is rottenness, decay, death. My mama taught about Lot to the kids. I say to the kids, they're all grown and married. Lord help. And some of them have kids of their own. I guess I shouldn't call them kids. But she talked about Lot and all of his regrets. Let me help you out with something. Lot was not lost. Read the New Testament. The Bible calls that man a just man. You know what just is short for? Justified. Lot spent his life sowing to his flesh. Every choice he made was about pleasing Lot. 
I have wealth, but I want more wealth. See, here's the thing about flesh, Carl. It ain't never satisfied. If I gave you 10 million, you'd want 20. If you had 20, you'd want 100. There, uh, listen, Hugh Hefner, or, or not Hugh Hefner, I'm sorry, Howard Hughes had more money than his great grandkids could spend. They said, Is there anything you want? He said, Yeah, one more dollar. You can't, listen, flesh can't be satisfied. So Lot went down when he should have stayed with an uncle that was spiritual. But I've learned that carnal Christians and spiritual Christians really don't get along. They get on each other's nerves. That's the truth. That's why they had to separate. Amen. Abraham was too spiritual for Lot. and Lot was too carnal for Abraham. That's right. So they had to split and go their separate ways. It ain't much change. It's pretty much that way now. But I will say this. But as the choices he made, he didn't ask the Lord. He didn't let the Lord guide his steps. He looked down and said, that place would be good for me and my cows. That's where I'm going to go. And I want to know something. And he kept getting closer to hell. That under, the, under the name of that day was called Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. And every step he took in his flesh, he's getting closer and closer to perversion, to the judgment of God. He raised a family down there. And I want to know something. He sowed for probably 20 or 30 years. And he reaped corruption. You know what he reaped? He reaped brimstone and fire and sulfur and burn up son-in-laws and burn up daughters. And if they had children, he had burn up grandkids. Don't know if he had them or not, I'm just saying. He had, he had, he had children that were married. Then he, I want to know something here. The family that left with him didn't really get out. Lost his wife on the way. You know the story. She turned and looked. God dealt with her. And the two girls that came out carried Sodom with them in their heart. That's why they made their daddy drunk and committed incest with him. Somebody said, why would they do such a thing? They was raised in perversion. That's all they knew. I want you to know something here. Somebody said, well, lots of, lots, lots of testimony that, you know, we can live somewhat worldly and be saved. I will tell you something. You might do it, but there's one thing for sure. You ain't going to take your family with you. Yeah, you can live carnally and diggle your foot in the world and dig. I want to show something here. You won't have no testimony, won't have no power, and your kids won't believe none thing about the God you say you serve. Amen. I don't mean to be mean, but I'm going to say it like this. If what you got won't ever take you to church, don't plan on it taking you to heaven when you die. Right. If it ain't good enough to go to the house of God on, why would you want to glow to glory on that? I want you to know something. I'm pastoring people. I ain't seen their faces in a long time, but they're at the campground on Sunday. I guarantee you what, you let one little thing happen, it'll be Brother Chris didn't come and see me. Brother Chris ain't seen you in your pew in a while. There's the problem. You want to see the preacher, go to where the preacher is. Amen. Now what's those something? I'm not saying they're lost, but I'm saying this. There'll be a day where they'll reap and they won't like what they've sowed what they get back. But I want you to know something here. If you'll give what you got to God, He will multiply it. Now here's the lie of the devil. He's going to tell you, you don't have anything worth giving. I beg to differ. I preached a couple Wednesday nights ago about that widow. She didn't think she had anything. Elisha said, what do you got? She said, I've got one pot of oil. That was enough for God to multiply. We all rejoice in the feeding of the multitude of the 5,000 men untelling how many women and children. There's a little portion of that story. If you're not careful, you'll overlook. It starts with a lad that gives what he had. Nobody eats if the lad don't give it up. Now watch, know something here. After the Lord created everything in six days, he didn't create another new thing ever since. You ever notice that? He just fixed it to where it could just keep going, keep going, keep going. That's why Jesus, when they said, we don't have anything to eat, the Lord didn't say, now let me make a buffet table with food. He said, what do you have? I'm not going to create anything new, but I can multiply, but I can multiply what you've already got. They said, we've got a little lad here with five loaves and two fishes. Now watch, know something. If the boy, how old he was, doesn't turn loose of it, all he can eat is once, maybe twice. That's all that meal will ever be. But the Lord said, what you've got, I want to know something, the Lord didn't take it from him, he had to give it to him. The Lord didn't go there and just jerk it out of his hands, he said, give it to me. And the boy took it, listen, 
The boy said, you know what? And I want to know something. We're getting back to sacrifice. If the boy gives it away, he ain't eating. He doesn't know what's going to happen. But he turned it over. And I want to know something here. The Bible said when it went into the Lord's hands, this is the part that gets me a little excited. Makes me want to act like Peg McC the McCamey lady, Peg. I'm about to think about kicking my shoes off. When it went into his hands, the, Lord, the Bible said, and Jesus blessed it, made it successful, and break it. And you know what you know what he did was he multiplied it over and over and over and over. What was five loaves and two fishes fed about twenty-five thousand people, and the boy, my friend, got to eat two. Amen. Don't you think for a second that the Lord let the lad go hungry? I don't buy that at all. I said that to say this. You are sitting in the pew and I'm standing before you and we think what we got really ain't worth a whole lot. Our church is small. My talents are few. But I want you to know something. If you'll turn loose of it. See, when you invest, you turn loose of it. If you invest money, Brother Roger can tell you about that, you're turning loose of it. It goes out of your hand and it goes into somebody else's. If you'll give the Lord what you have, I, I don't care how little you think it is, I don't care how insignificant you think it is, when it goes through his hands and he blesses it and he breaks it, he's able to multiply it over and over and over and over and over again. Now I'm going to tell you what three things you got, every one of us has got, that you can sow if you're smart enough to sow it. Three things, we've all got them. Some of us got more, some of us got less. Number one, you've got time. I don't know how much time you've got, but you've got time. I told you a minute ago, a lot of times we say we don't have time. The problem with it is we made bad choices with our time. That, that's really the truth of the matter. And I'm going to tell you something here. Your relationship with your Savior it's just like your relationship with your spouse or with your kids. If you want it to be worth a nickel, you've got to invest some time in it. I heard a wise preacher say yesterday, preaching down in North Carolina, he said, if you don't make time for your kids when they're small, they won't make time for you when you're old. It's an investment. You invest in them while they're small. Amen and amen. If you want to know how selfish somebody's been, look how they are at the end of their life. Everybody that's been selfish is always alone. You know why that is? Selfishness leads to emptiness. You've got time. So I said, well, I, you know, I would get closer to the Lord, but I just ain't got no time. You've got time. You've got time. I'm going to say this. It's true about me just like it's true about you. We right now, Carl, we're as close to him as we want to be. We got just as much of him as we want to have. Amen and amen. You've got time. Here's the thing about it. Don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. It's, it, you know, people used to say, well, everybody that dies a Christian, they get to the end of their days, and they all say the same thing. I wish I'd have done more. I wish I'd have given the Lord more time. That's not true. Not everybody said that. Paul didn't say it. You know why? Didn't waste his time. John the Baptist didn't say it. John the Baptist prepared all of his life for six good months. He got everything God wanted him to accomplish done in six months. Jesus did everything the Father wanted him to in three and a half years and got it done. You don't have to die like that. You don't have to die and say, well, I wish I'd done more. Just make better choices with your time. Like Brother Roger was saying, you don't got to be in this kind of position to pray. You can pray in the car. I believe they call that now multitasking. Yeah. You can pray in the car. You can pray on your job. Yeah, you realize now we live in such a fantastic age. I've got an app on my phone that'll read the Bible to me. And I like the man's voice reading it better than I do my imagination. He's got a little bit of an accent. It sounds pretty cool. I thought, man, he's reading it better than I can imagine. It. You can do that while you're doing something else. Yeah, just make better choices with time. Because here's the thing about it. There come a time when you'll want to invest time and you will not be able to. The Lord said, the night cometh when no man can work. In other words, he's saying, there'll be a time when you want, but you won't be able to. So make good choices with your time. I want you to know something. There's people wasting this opportunity to be one of God's people. But I want you to know something. Just on down the road, when they're an invalid, they'll say, I wish I could go to church. Well, there was times you could have and you didn't. So you better take advantage of it every single time. You better come in and thank God God lets you to come. If we leave and it was as dead as a doornail. There's people tonight... 
laying in nursing homes all over this city, all over this state, and all over this country would like to come to the house of God, and they can't. Make good use of your time. Number two, invest so your talents. I know people sitting here going, I don't have any talents. That ain't what the Bible says. I've learned this. God has given us all gifts to profit others with. Yes. See, the fellow that, that's down, you know, I think about this. At school, the kids will love this. In school, they try to put everybody in one little box. And if you can't spit back to them what they've been trying to give you, suddenly you're not smart. I don't buy a word of that. Everybody has intelligence. Everybody has God-given intelligence. It just might be in a different way, in a different form, a different field. I want you to know something here. The fellow that wrenches on your car, you better thank God that he knows how to do it if you don't. Amen. Now watch those something here. I believe this. I believe God's given spiritual gifts. I can take you through the Bible and show them to you. But here's the thing about it. What good does your gift do if you don't sow it? If God's given you the gift of teaching, it don't do you no good if you ain't going to teach somebody. I'm going to say this. I know you ain't going to believe this. God didn't give me the gift of preaching for me. He gave it to me to benefit other people. My preaching don't help me. It's for other folks. What's those something? If God's given you the gift of giving, turn loose of that money. Amen. Or whatever it is you got, clothes, food, whatever you got. If that's your gift, then give it out. But what's those something here? Somebody said, well, I don't know about that. Let me tell you something. On the day of judgment, the Lord, I, I can read you the parable where the Lord lines up all the servants and he's, he's judging them on what they did based on what he gave them. Now watch those something. You're not responsible to sow Brother Carl's gift if you ain't got it. But you are responsible to sow yours, whatever you have. If you've got multiple gifts, sow them all. Our gifts are, listen, I'm going to say this because some people get twisted up on gifts. Let me tell you something about gifts. They're not spiritual superpowers. They're not for the person that has the gift. God gives the gift for the other people. Jesus' ministry didn't benefit him at all, but it benefited thousands of other people. Amen. That's why in the, that's why in the wilderness he couldn't make bread for himself. Hello. Yeah. When God gives you a gift, it ain't so you can walk around going, I've got these. God gave you a gift so you'd humbly spend it out for two reasons. Every time you sow your gift, you glorify God, and it's for the good of man. Well, I don't, I don't know what you have. I will say this. If you don't know what you have, you best be finding out. Because here's the thing about it. Whether you ever find out or not, you will be responsible for what you did with it. You realize nobody can go before God on the, at, at the judgment seat of Christ and say, Lord, I just didn't know. He said, I gave you one talent. I gave you five talents. I gave you ten talents. Where's mine? What'd you do with it? And I will say this. Whatever God gives, he expects me to multiply it. Lord, thy pound has gained 10 pounds. That sounds like multiplication to me. Amen. Amen. So I don't know what it is you got, but find out what it is and give it away. I'll say this too. Don't worry about whether the folks are worthy or not. Keep giving it away. Amen. Do you realize that the Lord fed a multitude of people on all those people you find out a chapter later didn't even believe on him? Right. That wasn't a waste. Amen. Amen. Just keep giving it away. If you have to spend your gift on somebody dirty, amen. Somebody you can smell before you can see, don't matter. Give it away. It won't be wasted. Number three, listen, every one of us has got time. Every one of us has got talents of some kind. And I'll tell you something else. You better learn to invest your treasure. Whenever you preach money, people tense up. And then I've heard it on the other end where the man in the pulpit goes to twisting people's arms. I'm not going to do that. God ain't taking it from you. He wants you to give it to him. Not more than that, he wants you to be glad to give it to him. Amen? But I will say this, tithing is a biblical principle. It's something I've learned that it's just as, it, God blesses it just as much now as he ever has. And I'll tell you something, you'll never know it if you don't try it for yourself. The Lord said, those that tithe, he said, he'll rebuke the devourer. In other words, everybody knows what the devourer is. It's the bill that you didn't see coming. It's the layoff you didn't see coming. It's the, it's the job opportunity. But the Lord said, I'll rebuke that if you're a tither. 
I want you to know something. And I found out he's still rebuking the devourer. He still does that. But I want you to know something here. I'm not going to twist your arm. God loves you. God, if he saved you, God will love you if you ain't going to give it to him at all. Yeah. You're still going to get to go to heaven, but you are going to miss out on a lot of blessings down here. Yes. Just being honest about it. I want you to know something here. And it ain't just about tithing. It's about giving to people that's in need. Amen. That's called almsgiving. Do you realize you're allowed to tell people you tithe, but you ain't allowed to tell anybody when you give alms. Right. Right. He said, when you give, he said, don't let the left hand know what the right's yep. doing. Right. You give that in secret. Right. Here's the thing about this. The Lord, there's a verse in Proverbs that said, when you give to the poor, you lend unto the Lord. Well, if you lend unto the Lord, that means that you have something on him. He'll never allow that to happen. He'll have Amen. to give it back to you somehow. Right. He'll never let you get on top yeah. of him. Amen. 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 I want you to know this. Listen. Uh, me and dad's talked about this in years gone by. You know, people got, people, biblical giving wasn't really taught, so people thought they was really doing something if they gave the Lord a dollar and a quarter. Somebody said, I've, I've been a Baptist 40 years, it didn't cost me more than five dollars. And listen, I want you to know something here. What I'm telling you, I'm telling you for your sake to be blessed. I'm not telling you because I'm trying to get something out of you. I, I don't even touch the money here. It goes to those folk over there, and they pay our bills and all that other stuff. I don't even see it. But I want you to know something here. When it goes into the plate, it don't go to yours truly. You give it to God. This is a storehouse, and you storehouse tithe. Yes. But what I was getting ready to say about this is I've had to learn to be generous, Carl. God had to teach me that. I was an only child. I didn't share nothing with nobody. I'm looking at Bren. Jeremy and Jeff was my brothers. I didn't even share with them. If they was here, they'd both say, Amen. And I grew up, and God gave me a good job right out of high school, and I made good money, and I always had to God be the glory. He gave it to me. I, it wasn't nothing I did. But I've always been of the opinion, I'll take care of me, you take care of you. And if you're down on your luck, maybe you just need to try harder. I've been that way. But God let me hit the bottom a few times and be in need. See, it's good for us, Car uh, Brad, to sometimes be in need. It does something to our hearts. And if you ever have somebody give something to you that God directed it, all of a sudden it does something to your heart and it makes you want to be generous to somebody else. And I will say this, uh, I'm glad that God's able to teach us that, but I want you to know something, it'd be better for you to just go ahead and do it than God have to teach you that. I've had to learn it the hard way. But I want you to know something here. I just said a moment ago, um, there was a man, in the scriptures in the parable, his grounds brought forth plentifully. You all know the story. Plentifully, rich man. He was ground brought forth more than what would fit in his barns. Why didn't it occur to that man to give away what wouldn't fit in the barns? Right. He already had enough. I done told you, flesh is never satisfied. He said, I'm going to pull down my barns and I'm going to build bigger barns and I'm going to get everything I got and put it in there. And you know the story? The Lord told it. He said, tonight your soul is required of you. He said, now who's your riches going to go to? They're going to go to somebody else. Now, the Lord said it this, after this, he said, so is everyone who is not rich toward God. Right. You know how you get rich toward God? You give away down here. Yep. That's exactly right. Now, I'll say this to you. In closing, there's a law of sowing and reaping that's just as constant as gravity. What you sow, you will reap. If you, you can't sow to the flesh and reap the spirit, it's impossible. It's impossible to sow to the spirit and reap the flesh. But I will say this, when you sow, there's a blessing that multiplies. It, it's true in nature. Like I said before, if you plant corn, it'll multiply when it comes out. And I'm telling you this, listen, there's a blessing of multiplication on sowing the right things. So these are the things we have. You ain't going to be responsible for what you don't have. These are what we've got. Let's make sure we sow our time right. Let's make sure we sow our talents while we've got the time and opportunity. And we better make sure we sow our treasure in the right places because if not, it'll be taken away and given to somebody else. I'm through preaching. That's the message that God gave me.